Welcome to episode 47 of How About Them Huskies. I'm Connor, and I'm joined by Andrew today, another two-man show. Though this time, I don't think we'll be getting a special guest <laughs> appearance like we did last time. This one's going to be legit two-man. There's, as always, a lot to talk about. The Huskies had a couple of little cupcake games since the last time. You, you guys heard from us. They beat Manhattan and beat New Hampshire, both for blowouts. We could probably talk for an hour about the two combined, but... We all know why you clicked on this video or, or listening to this podcast. It's for the Kansas preview, the game. But when you're listening to this, the game's tomorrow, maybe even tonight, depending on what time or what day you're listening. But I think we could talk about the Manhattan and New Hampshire wins for a little bit. I mean, this, like I said before we came on, there's not much to talk about. I mean, we blew out Manhattan 90-60. to 60. Tristan Newton had a triple-double, his third of his career. He's now the all-time UConn triple doubles leader with three, which doesn't seem like a lot, but at the same time, there's only been what now 14 in program history. So it's quite an accomplishment for him there. Yeah. I mean, that game was pretty fun to be at, you know, like you look at these non-conference games, you're like, you know what, honestly, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I went because of the St. John's package. Cause I can't wait to go to that game too. But I was like, you know what, I'll go to this. Uh, Ray Allen was there. I was fortunate enough to meet him. That was awesome. Um, but it was, in general, a really good crowd, too, for a Friday afternoon game against a team at the, what, near bottom of the Mac-ish for a really not good team. So that's what I really like to see. So, honestly, that's my that was my favorite part of the game. You know, Ray being there was great. The Newton triple-double was great. But I loved having the XL Center pretty full because I hate games that are absolutely dead. Like, they're just not fun. Like, I remember going to LIU against uh, – us at Gamble years ago, and it really was not very fun. So I just – I really like seeing the the full XL center for a game like that. But, yeah, I mean, there's not much to talk about in that game. Nobody really had a bad game. Nobody had a fantastic game either. I mean, Newton's triple-double is great. Samson showed a lot. Diara actually played pretty well. But, yeah, Manhattan, I feel like we looked way better than we did against Mississippi State in that game too. But – yeah, there's just, there's not much to talk about with this one. Yeah, that was a big bounce back. Obviously, the Empire Classic was in between, but the last time we played a cupcake school, we kind of struggled a little bit. And we kind of also struggled a little bit against New Hampshire. We'll talk about that in a matter of seconds here. But, yeah, like you mentioned, Diara, 11 points. I'm pretty sure they said that's his UConn career high. It makes sense. Yeah, only averaged, what, like two or three last year. So to see him confident scoring the basketball, Jalen Stewart also had seven points. He knocked down a three. Just the role players like that are going to be really important over these next few weeks against these top teams, especially for a reason we'll get into when we talk about Kansas, about a particular player who will not be playing. But yeah, Klingon had 17 and 18 minutes. He's one of the most efficient players in the country. Cam Spencer, a very quiet 18. He's quietly leading the team in scoring at 16.2, I believe, points per game. I mean, we expected Cam to come in and knock down some threes, but I didn't expect leading scorer amongst like there's five double digit scores and he's the top one I certainly didn't expect that yeah this is gonna sound really weird and definitely gonna get blown out of proportion but he reminds me key word here reminds me of a Larry Bird type of player like obviously obviously he's not as good as Bird but he reminds me of him in a way you know just the the pass and cut and then shoot it when you're open kind of guy and he's very efficient so I feel like yeah he is quiet because he's not this showboat flashy guy that tries to dunk everything. He knows his job. He knows what he's there to do, and he does it very well. So I'm happy. I'm happy we've got him. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know where we'd be without him. Obviously, losing Hawkins, losing Joey. We, I said this every episode about Cam. It's the same little speech, but it 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 makes a point. It's true. But I think now we can just switch over to New Hampshire. That's enough of Manhattan. Only a twenty point win versus the the Wildcats of UNH. It was. I I kind of I watched this when I could. I, I had class at the time. I had it on in the background, but the shots really weren't falling from distance outside yeah. of Cam. They made it went four for 28 from three as a team. New Hampshire shot 29 free throws. I'm pretty sure they were all in the second half, if I'm not mistaken. It was just a foul fest late, and especially in a 20-point game. I mean, we didn't really need that. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's on the refs or if that's on us for fouling. It's, as always, it's usually a combination of both. But what are your thoughts overall on the UNH game? So I watched it in full, and I don't want to sound like our our famous fifty one minute whining episode after the after the St. John's game, where I think we tore every single ref to pieces. But I'm gonna say the refs weren't fantastic. 
But also, we we looked like the, that was the most lackluster defense I had ever seen played by this team. I mean, we weren't moving quick. People were crossing their feet on defensive shifts. They were just reaching. They weren't getting out to block shots. They weren't boxing out. They were just grabbing people and throwing them. That's not going to win you games. I mean, even against a team like UNH, you still – you got to do everything right because we should have beat this team by 40. I mean, they're really – they're not good. But that was – it was a combination of the refs were calling a lot of touch fouls, which wasn't helping us. But also, the defense really was not very good. I mean, the only thing that was really good was the inside shots. That's because of Klingon and Samson. Klingon at 29. I know Samson had a bunch too, but that was the only thing that was really good. Our three-point shots weren't falling. We hit one as a team besides Cam Spencer. That can't ever, ever happen again, no matter what. I mean, you guys are college basketball players and I mean some of them might be getting paid to be here you're on a full scholarship you should be able to hit threes against the University of New Hampshire I mean I I don't want to sound like that St. John's episode but just bad defense and bad offense overall just it's just another game that you want to just forget about move past it yeah there's also the conversation which I don't think is true you could argue this for Kansas as well because last night or two nights I don't honestly don't remember what night it was I think it was last night they were playing Eastern Illinois. They only won oh, by yeah. eight. I'm thinking maybe, maybe this is the team. You know, you're looking at Kansas on Friday and you're just thinking UNH on Monday. I will win that no matter what. But like you said, Klingon, a career high 29. I mean, he was dominant. I feel like we say this, he could score 40 every game against these teams. This was a, a demonstration of that. He played half the game and had 29. I feel like he could easily be averaging like 24 points per game if we wanted him to be right now. But yeah, he had a big night. They just couldn't stop him. Newton kind of struggled from the field, five for fourteen, but he almost had another triple double. He's gonna have a huge year. I'm not. I don't know if it's just because Castle's out and he's a major. He's like pretty much the only real ball handler in the starting five. But I, he's gonna have an incredible All American type year. I feel like I've got something to say about him real quick. Actually, so I saw John Rothstein. He tweeted something. By the way, this is no no shade to John. He I love I love his tweets, all the mm-hmm. funny stuff he tweets out. But he said that he's like Newton's quietly becoming one of the best point guards in the country. No, he is one of the best point guards in the country. And this is gonna tie back to Hurley's quote about the guys who that just watch TikTok and don't really know anything the TikTok highlights. He is one of the better point guards in this um in this Division one NCAA, like it's it's simple. You got to actually watch the guy play. You know, the only guys to get recognized are the the guys at the big schools. Well, we're the national champions, and we are a big school, so you you better start watching us. Because I told people this last year with Jackson how he was going to be a great NBA player. Look how he is. Same with Hawkins. Like, I mean, you just you got to stop watching the TikTok highlights and actually start watching the real ones. Like Newton is a beast. He is one of the uh, he's the top five point guard in college basketball. I'll back that point till I die. I mean, it's just, it's true. And it, it's just kind of annoying seeing our guys get underlooked and then everybody's talking about them like they've been watching them for months like we have. But, I mean, I'm 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 real glad to see him doing well, though. Very happy he decided to come back. Yeah, definitely. Especially after that title game he had. He was led, our, he led us in scoring 19 points, 10 rebounds. You think maybe then he'll get some recognition. Oh, this guy's coming back? But no, I, I think part of it's being in the Big East to not – it's all down to the media stuff, the media rights, not having ESPN backing us. Obviously, we're F- F- Fox Sports, FS1, Big East. That's what they are. If, if Newton was putting up, like, what, 15, 8, and 7 average at Duke or any of those ACC yeah. schools, he'd be getting, like, National Player of the Year hype right now. But, alas, that's not the case. And we know he's good. I'd, I'd almost rather him fly under the radar like he kind of has been, kind of sneak up on teams. But yeah, just to finish up real quick, UNH, Camp Spencer, another quiet 17. He was our only real shooting threat. He had a couple early, I saw. But if he's good for three or four threes a game, we're going to be in a really good spot. And outside of that, not much. Solo ball is kind of – he's kind of struggled. We're not going to get into that really too much. He's a freshman starting when he didn't when he didn't anticipate to be a starter he's started what now five straight games he's he's doing he's playing his role he's getting he's knocking down he knocked down a three he gets the putbacks like he did at the empire classic he knows his role his role is not to score 10 to 12 points even if he could but the last guy i want to highlight here another one that's struggling kind of sneakily struggling because he was huge for us 
in that Empire Classic is Alex Caravan. He was three for 11 from the field, 0 for 6 from three against New Hampshire. He's down to 31% from three on the season, which is kind of crazy to say because he's actually had a pretty decent year. He's up a lot in the points per game from last year, but I think he'll figure it out. He's a definitely a good enough shooter. Yeah, he's up over five points per game, and he's shooting 10% less from three just about. So I think he's just in a slump, and he'll he'll get out of it. I think he'll have a big game against Kansas. Oh, 100%. He's in a slump. He's going to find it fine. I'm not going to overreact on anything. He's just – everybody goes through a slump. I mean, Spencer had a bad game. He's had a couple bad games. But like I said with Spencer, I'm more than happy for him to get it out now against these teams and have him – have a game like that versus Kansas. Because if he has a game like that versus Kansas, we have no shot of winning it. So I'd much rather have him have it against Manhattan and UNH than Kansas. Yeah, even if he's 0 for 6, I certainly want him taking that seventh shot. I mean, I'm confident he can knock down any three. We saw it at the Garden. He's knocking down shots from like five or six feet beyond the NBA line. His range is crucial for this team. That was way out there. Yeah, it was like... like, close to the logo. Yeah, it's... He's a great shooter, bottom of the line. Him and Cam, are they're going to combine most nights to hit eight threes at least. I guess that's actually kind of a stretch, eight threes at least. They're going to combine to hit six or seven threes. But, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'll talk about UNH. I mean, they had that one dude hit, what, six threes? I, every time I looked down, he hit another one. I mean, I looked it up. He's out of eligibility. I'd be like, this would be a guy to bring in next yeah. year. But he's a super senior grad student. But, they got some players. They had three guys combined to score 58 of their 64 points. They're going to be – I think they're going to be pretty solid in their conference this year. I heard they're supposed to be near the top. So maybe maybe we'll meet them in March as a 1 versus 16. Who knows? But yeah. <laughs> I think it's finally time to move on to the reason you're all here, the Kansas game. It's it's going to be a, an amazing atmosphere at Allen Fieldhouse. It's going to be insane. Yeah, the students are already – in their seats three days before the game. It's just going to be madness. And it's a, a top five matchup. We, I wanted it to be one versus two, but Purdue and other reasons that didn't happen, but it's four versus five. We're actually higher ranked, which I mean, looking at our teams, I expect that, but going into the year, I didn't expect it to be above Kansas, but what's before I really get into the breakdown, how are you overall, how are you feeling about this game? Like going into it, like, are you confident? What, what What's the thought process for you? Well, so right now, I mean, watching Kansas struggle against Eastern Illinois, I think it means it means nothing. I mean, we struggled against Valley State. We struggled a little bit against UNH. That means nothing right now. What means more to me is how Klingon played in the last game and how hopefully that carries over to his biggest test in his career. You know, he's faced Kalel Ware. That was a little bit of a test. He's played some big guys in March Madness. I think he might have defended Timmy, but this is his biggest test to date. And it's Hunter Dickinson. And I really hope that he comes ready to play. Because if he is not ready to play and he's lazy, then we are going to get smoked. And that's just not what I want to see. But I'm confident that Klingon's going to – I don't think he's going to score a lot. I think him and Dickinson combined are going to have uh, – this is my hot take for this game. Klingon and Dickinson combined are going to have under 20 points. Because mm-hmm. they're just going to go at it in the post. And it's going to be really good defense, and they're going to have to pass out of it. But that's honestly, that's the matchup I'm more excited for is him versus Dickinson. Because obviously, we want to beat them. You know, there's some Twitter beef there, but um, it's I can't wait. I'm not necessarily nervous. You know, the road uh, being on the road does concern me. I mean, we've lost at some not so great road atmosphere, so being on the road really does concern me. But I do think we are the better team. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, somehow, I just realized we haven't mentioned we broke the double-digit streak, 24 yeah. straight non-conference. I feel like that's in jeopardy. I I feel, I feel con- I wouldn't be surprised either way if we win by three or win by – I'd be surprised if we won by 15, but I, I feel like we have the talent to do so. But it's it's gonna not going to be a close win. That's what I'm going to say. It won't be a close win. Yeah. We're either going to lose by a few or win by a lot. Yeah, it's it's tough to win a close game like that on the road with not saying the refs are against you, but, you know, this brings up a stat I had. I have a couple written down. Bill Self has lost 17 games at home, and this is year 21. So it's it's a tough place to win no matter what the Kansas roster looks like. They're dominant at home, but that number, I mean, 
18's got to come at some point. Why not Friday night? But I have a couple of like more stats that I wrote down. I found about Kansas. They're they don't really take a lot of threes. They're three hundred seventh in the country in three point attempts per game. I'm I we're gonna break wow. down the guys to watch for them. I kind of have a whole little breakdown of each guy, but they don't take a lot of threes. They make they make like thirty three percent, I believe I saw, which isn't a lot. It's like six for eighteen per game, which I don't know. You expect you look at us. I feel like our entire offense is either three pointer or Donovan inside. It's, it's weird to see a team that doesn't take many perimeter jumpers. It's kind of Kansas is kind of like what Indiana thinks they can be and wants to be Yeah, where they they're pretty much big man oriented. Not a lot of guards, not a lot of threes, but Kansas is actually good at it. So that's a shot at Indiana, but (laughs) I think we could start with Dickinson. Yeah. He's the main event in this one. He's averaging 21.7 points, 12.7 rebounds. Obviously there's a couple of cupcakes sprinkled in there, but against Kentucky, he had 27 and 21. Now I know Kentucky pretty much doesn't have a big man right now, but that's still very impressive numbers. And he's a guy that he can stretch the floor. He can and will take threes, which Donovan has to be alert. Samson as well. He's going to – even in transition, I saw in Maui I was watching, he's like catch and shoot coming on the floor taking those three. So he's a stretch big, something we really haven't seen too much this year. So I'm curious to see how Donovan reacts to that. That scares me. Um, I'm going to be honest. That's the one part of this game that scares me is when he's going to pull up because Donovan's not going to stop at the top of the key. I mean, he's he'd be stupid to do that because if they run like a ball screen and he gets through it, Dickinson, that is. Then he's got wide open layup. So I think what Hurley's going to do is he's going to put Caravan at the top no matter what. And Caravan's not going to play inside at all. He's going to be floating around the top and just waiting to go back on defense. So at least there's somebody to stop him if Dickinson gets loose. I don't know. It's gonna. I feel like it's going to be kind of a mess to start, honestly. That's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting it for it to be a complete mess. And they've got to get, figure things out in the first eight, nine minutes. It's not going to be organized, but... Once we figure it out, it'll be fine. But that is the main thing that scares me is his transition threes because those are going to kill us. Yeah, and he, I don't have the numbers up. I'm pretty sure he's like 8 for 13 from 3 this year or something. So he takes like 2 a game, but he's making them. So you yeah, got to look out for that. And he had his worst game in their loss against Marquette. Obviously, we know Marquette fairly well. Well, first of all, Marquette beat them by 14 on a neutral court in Maui. It was, I guess it was the second straight day the teams played obviously in the in the invitational but he had 13 points versus Marquette five turnovers I feel like that's going to be how we try to get him and Kansas we got to force them to turn the ball over they have some guys that are prone to doing that at times and obviously I I think obviously he had his worst game versus Marquette Donovan had arguably his best game last year against Marquette not counting his perfect shooting against LIU in that road game against Marquette, he arguably had his best game as a Husky, as a freshman. So interesting to see how they could stop Dickinson this year. Also, Godaro and Ben Gold, the big men, but they struggled against Klingon last year. And I have another comparison comparing guys. You can you could argue Klingon and Edie can be compared. They're both really tall, really skilled big men. Last year, obviously, Dickinson was at Michigan. Edie plays for Purdue. Dickinson had 21 points against Zach Edie in the in the year before, obviously, Edie was playing like half the minutes like Donovan did last year. He balled out there, too. So he may not be phased by the bigger the bigger target, I guess, in Donovan. But if we stop him, I feel like we're golden. That's, I mean, that's going to be the key. And they're waiting for each other. I mean, Dickinson really hasn't faced a, a good big this year, and neither is Clean. So they're they're waiting for each other, I think. Yeah, definitely. Next guy we'll talk about, I feel like Dickinson, we just talked the most. The rest are going to be less and less as we go. But Kevin McCullough Jr., this is a guy who's kind of bursted on the scene this year. He was a Texas Tech transfer. He's already had two triple doubles. Obviously, Newton led the country last year with his two. This guy had two in the first like week and a half. He had 12, 10, and 10 versus Kentucky, and then 22, 11, and 10 against Chaminade, which it counts, but it's still Chaminade, D2, D3, whatever they are. But He's having a breakout year scoring. He's up to almost 19 points per game. He never scored more than 11 any other year. He's a fifth-year guy, but he's shooting under 30% from three, and he's kind of their biggest three-point threat as like a wing, like guard slash forward. Obviously, technically, you'd argue Dickinson is their biggest threat in the starting lineup, but 
for the actual like shooters, he's their biggest threat and he's shooting 30%. And I feel like he's going to be kind of a mismatch because he's like a six, six, he's kind of like an Andre Jackson type build. And we don't have an Andre Jackson. You'd argue Stefan Castle, who will not be playing in this game. He'd probably be guarding McCuller for the, just to match up with size. But I feel like solo ball is going to have this assignment just because it's, it comes down to him and cam. And I feel like solo is kind of, not that Cam's a bad defender, but Solo's more athletic. He forced deflections. I feel like this is – we talk about how he's lengthy. He can be disruptive. I feel like this is the game. Solo Ball gets his first big defensive assignment in Kevin McCuller. Yeah, I mean, McCuller's quick, and so is Solo. So he's going to have to be the guy that just stays on him like like a fly on dog poop. That's the, <laughs> that's the analogy I'll make there. Because he's got to. I mean, he's got to stay on him because – He's going to be that guy. Obviously, Clean is just going to stay on Dickinson the post, but you've got to stay on him because he is going to be that guy that is going to make you pay if you leave him open. And I feel like, oh, what's a game I can relate this to? Shoot, I don't know. But he's he's going to be that annoying guy that just keeps hitting shots if you leave him open. So he's a very good player, and we've we've got to stop him in transition too. But, I mean, he is definitely their biggest three-point threat, and he's not even great at hitting him. But still, that's that's a huge assignment for Solo, but I think he's ready for sure. Yeah, definitely. The next guy, I guess we're going down in order of their best player to their not best players. KJ Adams is a forward. He's gonna play the four for them. He's he's a solid frame. He's six seven, but he's kinda like kind of bulky, kinda like he's pretty much the same same build as Alex Caravan, but a little stronger. He's zero three ball, zero three point game which could allow for some different lineups for us. I remember I saw Hurley had a quote today, or it might have even been Donovan. I don't know who said it, but they, Donovan and Sampson might play together because the four-man isn't a threat to be in, shoot the three. So Sampson can guard him down low as Donovan's guarding Dickinson down low. It's just an option to have, especially if you don't want to play a Jalen Stewart. You want to take away his three minutes and give him to Sampson at the four especially in a big game like this. But, yeah, K.J. Adams, he's an efficient scorer, but an awful free throw shooter. He's four for 16 this year as their third best player. But there's not much more to say about him. I mean, he's a guy that's going to get you probably 10 to 12 points down in the post. He's going to grab a few rebounds, play some solid D. But I feel like Caravan should handle him fine. And Caravan's kind of a mismatch for him because he can shoot the three ball. Hopefully he does it efficiently. So I've been thinking about this matchup a lot, and I am glad you brought up the – fact that he's an awful free throw shooter because I was going to bring it up if you didn't and that's why I wouldn't be surprised if our starting five tomorrow night is Newton, Ball, Caravan, Samson, Klingon because if Caravan gets in foul if he if he does foul him say he's got three in the first half of them like that Spencer comes off the bench and Samson just slides down he guards him and then you get um you get Spencer in there and you've still got your two three-point shooters so it's just – I think – I wouldn't be surprised if that's the matchup because Caravan's assignment might be just a foul, get him to the line, get three yeah. points out of three possessions instead of six, eight, nine, something like that. Yeah, you say just foul, just separate. I remember what seeing I mean, the highlights. not on purpose, but – Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know, to. but this is this came up. I just remembered Andre Drummond last night, how the Celtics were hacking him. Yeah. The hack of Drummond with like – seven minutes left for the in-season tournament, which, by the way, Andre Jackson and Jordan Hawkins both advanced the Bucks and the Pelicans. I'm, I haven't been following the NBA too much, but I follow them. I follow their games. There's a chance they could meet in Vegas for a championship, obviously awesome. not a real championship, but yeah, that'd be really cool. Hawkins is playing well. I know they're playing tonight. I don't know how he's doing. He's, I assume he's doing his usual, but we're getting off track. We got to talk about Dewan Harris, the point guard. He's their fourth best player and he doesn't shoot which is very interesting. He he scored 42 points this year in seven games. 23 of those came in the game. He actually did shoot against Kentucky where he hit five threes. But outside of that, he scored 19 points in six games, averaging that's just, just over three points per game. I mean, they're fourth best player, and they really, spoiler, have four good players only. Doesn't shoot the ball. He's a good playmaker, don't get me wrong. He averages like six assists per game. He was a starter on their national championship team two years ago now. But he's also a great defender. But just this is this kind of leads into how I feel like we can beat them because they have they don't have many weapons. And if their fourth best player is a guy that barely takes shots, even if he's assisting and making plays, he had one point 
against Eastern Illinois and they won by eight. I mean, I don't know. I feel like he might give us some trouble defensively. Dewan Harris against Tristan and Hassan Diar. They got to be careful bringing the ball up, but I feel like he's not too much of a threat. Sure, this is the game he's going to go off and score 25, but yeah, as of right now, I don't think he'll be too much of a threat. Yeah, Newton's going to have to really, really show up. And that's where I see another matchup. I don't think Hurley's going to be afraid to just throw people in there. He's probably not going to be afraid to throw a Diara in there to play defense on him. I think we're going to see some weird lineups at some point. But I'm not going to question it because I think he's been preparing for this. I mean, I I read a tweet that said that Hurley was, like, glued to the um, Kansas-Marquette game in the press conference room as the players were doing their press conference at the Empire, I think. He was glued to that game. So that's that's great to see. But I I think he's got a whole game plan that obviously we don't know about, but I trust what he's doing. And I'm not I'm not necessarily worried. Yeah. I mean having guys obviously having the veterans in Tristan and Diara to bring the ball up, I think that's beneficial because it's veteran versus veteran. If it was veteran versus freshman, like I'd be a little worried if Harris was guarding Castle. Maybe he picks his pocket once or twice. Not saying Castle would do bad, but just having that experience with Newton and Diara is crucial. And I agree, we might see some weirder lineups. I'm, obviously, we're only going to see maybe eight if Stewart gets his three minutes, but we really know the seven guys are going to play a majority of this game. But we'll finish up real quick for, for Kansas. Pretty much the rest are nobodies. I mean, El Marco Jackson's a freshman guard. He started every game. He's, he's just all right. He's averaging just under six points per game, 23% from three. He's the guy. I know I just said this about Dewan Harris. He's the guy that's going to have his career game because I feel like everyone has to have a career game against us, and it's going to be him. El Marco Jackson, write that down. If it's true, I'm sorry. But then we got a familiar name to the program, Nicholas Timberlake. Uh, He's a three-point sniper. He's a snipist that shoots 29% from three. Yeah. He's averaging four points per game, obviously. I feel like he'll everyone... be the guy to have his stupid career high. He'll go for yeah. 40. Yeah, he'll hit like seven threes. But obviously, if you don't know the backstory, we thought we were getting him in the portal in like April. It was down to like us in Kansas. There might have been a third school. I don't remember. But he's from the Northeast. He's from Massachusetts. It was It felt like a UConn lock, and then he commits to Kansas. But we got Cam Spencer out of it, so that's cool. He's Timberlake averaging four points per game. He doesn't play much. He's only playing 13 minutes per game as like their sixth man. So Kansas plays their starters a lot, which could be beneficial if we get them in the foul trouble because they're not too deep. So yeah, all in all, Nick Timberlake, he's going to probably knock down two or three threes just because, but I'm not too worried about him. The next guy, I'm not saying I'm worried, but he's like the ultimate mismatch nightmare for us. Johnny Firth, Johnny Furphy. That's a tough name to say. It's Murphy with an F. He's a very intriguing player. He's 6'9". He's Australian. He's a freshman who can handle a ball. He hasn't missed a shot inside the arc all year. He's only taken seven, but he's more of a guy who's out there to take threes. He's eight for 23 from distance. He's, like I said, a mismatch. I mean, we don't really have anyone 6'9 that can guard a ball handler. He's not going to play more than 15 minutes, but for that time, it's going to be a struggle for us. He'll probably hit a couple of threes, but... Like I said, a mismatch nightmare. He's going to be, I feel like, a good player. He's a highly recruited freshman, highly touted. He's going to be a good player for them, but not on Friday. I think that's a Jalen Stewart assignment, in all honesty. I think that he'll he'll get in there to get to defend him because he is weird. Like, I've never seen a six foot nine guy who handles the ball like that guy. And I feel like when when we see who's guarding him, it's going to be Stewart because he can handle the ball also. But I feel like he's got quick enough feet. Like, Caravan's not quick enough to defend him. Samson's too long to defend him. So I feel like, of all people, it'll probably be Stewart or maybe even Newton. I don't know about that one. but tough. It's going to be a weird, weird matchup when he gets in there, for sure. Yeah. They got a couple more guys off the bench. I'll mention their names because they play. Jamari McDowell, he's a freshman who I was watching their game in Maui. He kind of impressed. I remember he hit a, he hit a couple of threes. I was like, this guy's actually not bad. And then I checked the box score of that game. I watched, oh, he only had seven points. I mean, he's 
he's not going to be too much of a factor. He did play 27 minutes in that game against Tennessee, which they won, but he played seven minutes against Eastern Illinois. You don't know what minutes you're getting from him. It's really, I feel like that fifth spot for them, like that last like kind of guard slash wing spot's going to come down to who's playing the best. I feel like that's what I've noticed a trend. It could be McDowell. It could be Furphy. It could be Timberlake. It could be Jackson. It really depends on how they're playing. And the last guy, Parker Brown. Wow, Parker Brown. I, I know his name's Brown, not Braun, even though it's spelled like that. Parker Brown, the brother of Christian Brown, who's on the Nuggets. He, he'll play eight minutes a game it, just to spell Dickinson. He scored four points in three games against actual competition. He's not a threat at all. I feel like looking at the backup big, Samson will eat him alive for those eight minutes. Yep. That will uh, be Klingon's break. Yeah, Klingon will get goes. his break there. But that's their bench. Like I said, they are not deep. They got really four four very talented players. They got some wild cards, and then that's pretty much it. I feel like you you need depth in a game like this. You could argue we don't really have it either with no castle. We really only have seven or eight guys that can go, but it's going to come down to who can make their shots and who can who can exploit the other better. I feel like we have to be making threes, especially if they don't take threes. We got to get the advantage there, and we got to limit Dickinson down low. Even if you use up some fouls with Donovan or Sampson, just get – I'd rather them earn the points at the line than just give them easy layups. No stupid threes, though. I don't want Kansas missing a three and then us just jacking one up 20 seconds in the shot clock. That is not what I want to see ever. I just want us to move the ball and tire their defense out. If we just move the ball, they're going to run all over the place because they're going to get all annoyed that we're just passing around. I We, we can 100% tire them out by standing in the same spots. Honestly, that's what I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could I could definitely see that see that happening. I'm I have a not a prediction, but it'd be cool to see. Obviously, we kind of had a little signature opening play the past couple of years. We used yeah. once in a while. I think you know where I'm getting at. Where Illinois and guard, Oklahoma State. Yep. A backdoor lob. Andre Jackson is in Milwaukee, but solo ball be good for that. <laughs> I, I mean, oh, why God. not? I guarantee you, Kansas is not preparing for a solo ball backdoor lob from Tristan Newton to start the game imagine imagine that just to open up I mean obviously that's probably not going to happen but that'd be something well it's probably still a play because it's all about how they sit up if they've got four guys above the free throw line I'm sure Hurley yells something and that's why they do it because oh battery if he's um if there's four guys above the free throw line one guy down low Solo is going to fly high, and he does have some bounce. Like, my God. He is literally like Jackson. Yeah, those Except two Jackson's putbacks. Those two putbacks, I believe it was Texas. Yeah, it was definitely Texas. Those two putback dunks were very Andre Jackson-like. I think we're just about done here. I know you just mentioned your battery's getting low, but there's not much yeah. more to say. I did see a stat on Twitter. I don't remember which of the UConn beat writers – said it but the huskies have beaten a top five team i'm re- reading it now have beat a top five team in non-conference in a non-conference road game only once in program history defeating number four stanford 70 to 59 february 6 1999 that was like back in the first title year with hamilton khalid khalid Alamin. we were number one ranked in that game we won against number four but i, I guess this is kind of leading into predictions I think we're going to have a second time where we beat a top five team and we'll make some score predictions. You want to go first with the score predictions for this game? You can choose UConn to lose. That's fine. But what do you, what's your score prediction final? Oh man. I'm going to go a very specific score. I'm going to go 77 to 68. Ooh. UConn winning, I assume. Yes. Yes. I think Kansas is going to, kill us in the first half and run out of gas. That's what I think. Mm-hmm. So, unfortunately, that nine-point win ends the streak. But we beat yeah. Kansas, so who cares? But like I mentioned in one of my posts, I don't care if it's Kansas or LIU. We have a streak. We're going to continue it. I feel like this could be bold. We could come out flat. But I feel like we can win by double digits against this team. Marquette did. Obviously, they didn't do it in their building. But Marquette, a team who we know we can beat, we beat them. Well, I guess only once last year out of three, but we beat them. I feel like the final, uh, I'll go like 82, 68. 
in that range. Uh, I don't know. I just feel like us making – we're going to certainly shoot better than four for 28 from three like we did versus oh, yeah. New Hampshire. I feel like making a few more threes, it'll – It'll even that out, but what did I say, 82, 68, something yeah. like that. I think that's and Speaking we'll of see. scores, I've got one more little fact. This is most more than likely than not. I read in this 24-game streak, we've only trailed to one non-conference team. I know it. I want to see. Can you name that one team that we've trailed to? At halftime, Iona. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, so, I, I saw that tweet as well. I, I knew it right away. I yeah. actually probably – if it wasn't in the tournament, I probably wouldn't have figured it out. But I remember yeah. being down in that game. But that's crazy. This that's is, almost as impressive. That is pretty insane, huh? Just yeah, and like trailing at halftime once. And we've been trailing like in the second half for like minutes, if that. It's just it's – yeah. it's a crazy streak that I hope continues. And if it does continue – North Carolina's on deck, a team that almost scored. They might have scored 100 against Tennessee. I saw they had 61 in the first half against the Kempom rated number one defense. I think they that was just on the TV. I think they were all, ended up with 89, I believe. Oh, so they kind of fell off in the second half then. Yeah. But the score 61 and a half is insane. But against the Kempom number one D, that's going to be a tough test at the Garden. A game Stefan Castle might be back for. Hurley said today. Hopefully. No dice for Kansas, which we kind of expected, but he might be ready six days from now for Carolina. I hope he is, even if it's just for a few minutes, just to get his feet wet before that big one afterwards against Arkansas Pine Bluff. Um, I think that's just about yeah. it for this Kansas preview. I mean, I think they're a beatable team. They've already lost to a team we beat last year, pretty much the same exact team we beat last year. It's going to be a great game, great atmosphere like I opened up with. I'm excited to watch, yep. unfortunately – can't be there. I know we both wanted to go, but it's tough to get to Kansas in December. It was a tough decision. I was all in, then I was out, then I was back in, then I was yeah, out. Yeah, pretty much say, the same with me. If you see this and you are going to the game, be loud, be obnoxious, and be a UConn fan because we're going to need it. Yes. Try your best Please. to start the, the U-C-O-N-N yes. chant. Start, It'll probably get cut off chance. before you fin- It'll get cut off before you finish the U, but might yeah. as well try <laughs> But be loud and obnoxious. Show our team that we've got people coming. Yep, definitely. It's actually going to be a great showing. I'm curious to see in the end. Obviously, it's going to be a Kansas-dominated home game, but Husky Nation shows out, and I expect it to be I expect it to be a dogfight. That's really all I got to say. I know it was a lot longer episode, but if you got nothing else, I think we're done here. Episode 47, Kansas Preview. Uh, we'll definitely do an episode after this game and before Carolina. I know we were inconsistent because I'm sure there are some of you listeners that would listen to a Manhattan recap and New Hampshire preview, but I feel like that wasn't very necessary. You kind of hit the nail on the head in like a few minutes about those games. But yeah, we got nothing else. I think that'll do it here. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode.